Genetically, most people are incapable of thinking out five or seven years. Mm. So the best they'll do in most cases is go to forecasts. Embracing the future, thinking about how things might be different and then how that might impact me and my world uh, is very hard for most people and that's why you don't see much of it. Most of us are focused on relatively near-term targets. If we're in a public company, quite often it's quarterly targets. We're surrounded by what's going on now. There's the urgent, there's the important, quite narrow things that we have to deal with crisis or the projects we're kind of trying to get delivered all the time we're trying to do too much mm. so there's very little headspace there's very little energetic space emotional space in in us to deal with these quite challenging concepts good morning good afternoon good evening this is af malhotra your host on straight talk now once again, I bring you, you, you know, I bring you some of the best guests ever. And today I have someone I have been watching and tracking and reading his work and inspired by numerous keynotes that you can often see on YouTube. Uh, we have an author, a thinker who is very disruptive and always ahead of the curve, you know, always ahead of the curve. In fact, many years back, I found this book. Uh, we're not talking about this book today, but this is uh, the book. And of course, the gentleman is Rohit Daldar, who's on my show today. Rohit, uh, welcome to Straight Talk. What an honor to have you on, on my show today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And I appreciate you having me. Yeah, no, the feel, feelings are mutual. And uh, look, you have written so many books. It's almost countless. And every year you produce one or more. And your latest book, which is part two of another book, which is Aftershocks and Opportunities, part two, uh, is um, you know making waves. And I know you're going to talk about what that means and why you wrote it. And there were numerous contributors to that book as well, I believe, 35 or 37 contributors, which is amazing. Again, about the future, again, about scenarios that we all need to be aware of and so beautifully articulated and written, which is why I love a lot of your work. And there's another book that I find particularly interesting, which is about us being human and you know being human is a huge part of the sort of the four tenets of what we do at straight talk one of them is being human and trying to make sure that we don't forget that humanity and what it means to be hu human isn't forgotten in this uh, crazy world of digital and ai that we are now usurped with and consumed by which is going to be topical because that's going to be the first part of our discussion so before we start um tell me a little bit about you know, it's very important for us to do this at Straight Talk. Who is Rohit Talvar before all of these books, before your fantastic keynotes? How did you end up here? And uh, a little bit about your backstory, the journey, the whistle-stop tour of um, Rohit Talvar. What do we need to know? Sure. sure. So we grew up pretty poor, um, really didn't have a huge amount of the latest toys and tech. Uh, so I was surrounded by friends at school who did, and then was kind of blown away by the moon landings and just what they meant um, as a, I think, a nine-year-old child at the time, uh, or seven-year-old. And um, I just, it just led to a deep kind of interest in what happens next and what happens after that. And that led me into doing electronics and computer science, going into artificial intelligence research, and then into management consultancy, where I just kept asking the question, you know, why are you doing what you're doing? Mm. Mm. and uh, found that a lot of people were doing it because they'd always done it, or those were the current trends that assume, they assumed would be the future. And then I found this whole field called future studies. I found the shell scenarios. I fell in love, started to speak at conferences, or I was already speaking about things like strategy and re-engineering. And I could very easily slip this stuff in. Yeah. And then just found that people enjoyed it. Uh, I think my... Strength is making these ideas about the future very accessible, explaining complex ideas in a way that my oldest living relative would understand, uh, which has become my mantra for everything. And uh, then we got into doing original research um, and evolving till the point where we've literally just launched the Singapore Foresight Academy um, which is probably one of the countries that's most advanced mm. in thinking about the future. So it was a natural place mm. to launch this program of educational offerings right. for people already at the forefront who wanted to go even further. 
Mm, fantastic. And you, you're you're in the UK, correct? Based in London, yes. Based in London. And is that has that been uh, the story throughout your your yeah, life? Yeah, born and raised in London, but I've yeah. uh, worked in over seventy countries around the world on six continents. Yeah. How long have you been doing your own thing? So you're the CEO of um, Fast Future. How long have you been running your own company in this? Wow. Uh, so I left uh, working for the man um, back in 1993. We moved house. Yeah. Uh, we got pregnant. Well, I, not me personally, but my ex-wife. Yeah. Um, and I quit my job within the space of five months. And I still have the piece of yellow accounting paper where we did the maths of what the minimum I would have to earn is <laughs> in order for us to feed ourselves house ourselves and not have to sell the baby sounds familiar sounds familiar to me and uh, all all respect and kudos to you for doing that and continuing it for three decades i mean it's pretty uh, outstanding and i think it's important to state that i, I want to get it clear that um intellectual thinking and writing books and researching areas is one thing but there is a person behind all of that work and that is you i mean your interests your passion uh, your struggles your failures, your successes. And so to build a company, because we talk about entrepreneurship a lot on this show, we have many entrepreneurs listening to this and watching this, the relatability factor is quite important. Whether you go off and build a tech startup that becomes a unicorn or fails, for that matter, or you're an author, or as you are, you are essentially producing manuals for the future uh, to a large extent. And I must say some of the work that I've read, and I haven't read all your books, obviously, but I have read many chapters. I'm a chapter reader. So I use books. I'm a, I'm, I've evolved in my reading because I have two little kids now, so I don't have time to finish books off. So I look, I, I, I use them, I use the index and I use it as a reference book. So I go to a chapter, read the chapter, think about it, then I may hit another chapter. I may not go back to it again, but actually I was looking through this, um, your book, and I saw my business cards in it in one, one of the chapters I'd finished off ages ago. I must have read that particular chapter. And it's very readable. You've made it easy to understand for you know many of us and that is super important if you need to create engagement and actually create change so people think differently i think you've you've really cracked that code and as we talk about cracking codes and uh trying to figure things out let's talk about what is really topical right now that i know that you have so much to say around and november 30th is the date we're going to start with november 30th now what happened on november 30th Rohit, and why is it so important for all of us well, so November 30th was the launch of ChatGPT. And those who'd been in the AI world for some time had seen the evolution of these so-called large language models, these generative AI tools that are basically like um, auto-correct uh, or uh, predictive text on speed. Yeah. And what we found was that three big things happened. Firstly, it's been the fastest adopted consumer technology in history, something like 200 million users now, over 9 million people use it every day, 600 million people have visited the OpenAI site every month, yeah. uh, and it's become embedded in the way people work, uh, and what's fascinating is it's a very, very complex technology if you look at the algorithms. Right. But it is a conversational interface. And that's something we, we can all learn from, that our most complex technology has the easiest interface and our oldest living relative could use it. So there's yeah. a lot we can learn. The second thing is it's led to a massive outpouring of creativity and innovation, whether it's in software development, the way people write, the way we market. Um, and in things like drafting legislation, a friend of mine drafted in a few minutes in the States a piece of legislation, which he shared with legislators and said, is this what you're really trying to do? And they were blown away. So it's incredible what that's done. But the biggest single impact it's had is that senior executives can access this as easily as doing a Google search. And, and it's blown them away. And it's also opened them up to just how far AI has come and moved from the world of stuff that was used by specialists who understood AI to now something that anyone could use. And then that's opened them up to looking at all of the other tools that are out there. And it's, it's driven real change. So we heard about, uh, 
in one case, a consultancy that had a 50 day piece of consultancy work for a client, some research. Yeah. And just before the contract was signed, the client canceled it and said, actually, we've got the information we need from a chat GPT search and a series of questions. Uh, and now all we want to do is to pay you for one day to look at what we did and tell us if there's anything missing. We heard a second one where, again, uh, this was from the client side, where they said, we were going to commission a piece of software development that was a few hundred thousand dollars. Mm. And again, we stopped the contract because a couple of our people, unbeknownst to us, took the spec, ran it through chat GPT, took the code they were given, took it to IT. IT said, yeah, that's pretty solid. And they're already using it. Mm. Uh, and so we're seeing what that's doing mm. is it's changing the speed at which we make decisions in business and it's changing the natural rhythm of how we operate in business. And that's phenomenal. It, it changes everything. And then we start to see what our staff are doing. And if you start to look at the day in the life of, of someone in their 20s, mm. their life is just permeated by AI from waking up in the morning to music that's been determined based on our mood last night, to using a personal tool to plan our day, our social, our business activities, to then going in and choosing what we're gonna eat using something like Yelp, based mm. on our choices, uh, choosing the music we're gonna listen to all day, depending on the type of task we're doing with Spotify, uh, using a range of editing tools now that generate the text we want and uh, tailor it to the audience we're, we're talking to using something like chat gpt or one of 30 or 40 other tools to find the information we need then going to the web to find additional information using something like glass where we can highlight stuff or yeah. copy it and edit it into a document but then let our colleagues see what we've done uh yeah. going to a meeting recording it with all sorts of tools uh, like Cogram that capture the audio, capture the text, the summary, and the action plan, writing a spreadsheet just by narrating it with something like Excel formula mm. block, mm. writing our own AI code using something like AI Accio with no uh, text, creating presentations with something like slides, generating our own images with DALI 2 or another tool, uh, planning meetings with session lab where you can keep changing it without having to edit everything all of these things creating our own uh, resume and, and uh, website mm. in minutes with something like resumeo an incredible array of tools mm. the company has no idea we're using them all sorts of security implications about putting mm. corporate data into them mm. so we've got to catch up but now the challenge is what, do we, what does that mean for our leaders? Are they digital leaders? Are they a digital asset who gets this and helping to get the best out of their people in this world, mm. and encouraging their people to tell us what they're doing without fear? Mm. Or are they a, a kind of legacy liability that's a dinosaur preventing us moving? So it's driving this whole set of new leadership skills that we require. We'll, we'll come back to that later, I think, to talk about what are the new leadership capabilities we need to navigate in the world we're, we're moving into? Mm -hmm. Phenomenal. I think there are a few things that come out. I mean, as you described some of those everyday events for our 20 year olds and, you know, a lot of it is about productivity and doing things faster and using something or a tool that allows you to do something that you don't really want to do, never really wanted to do right? Whatever it may be. Oh, it took you way too long to do it. And you put your time and energy in trying to do that yesterday and you frustrated by it. And now you've got a tool that does it for you faster. And we saw you know, a great example and best example of that that's universal is Google, right? Where the search engine has changed everyone's life. You know, in an instant, you find something that would have taken God knows how long for you to discover if it was an encyclopedia or a book, for example. So now let's Let's step back for a moment. So you describe a life of a 20-year-old. Have you start, started to figure out whether these practices, and as, as crazy as they sound for many people, um, are mirrored in other demographics? Or is this just like the Gen Z thing that one does? Do you see the adoption happening? Like you say, you know, the oldest person in the family, that's how you write your book so they can understand it. But are you seeing that drip feeding happening or the halo effect kicking into the, the older generations? 
So it's it it varies by generation. And again, um, talked about Singapore. Uh, we have a partner there, and they were saying that on average they're just doing a piece of research about tech, and they said around three out of ten Singaporeans are now using it. But the rate is much higher, sort of around 50% of people under 30. And that's not a that's not untypical of other technology. Mm. But I think because it's so easy to use and because it's become part of the public dialogue, it will increase its rate of adoption amongst older generations. And we're using chat GPT now almost as a generic, like a Google mm. search. Mm. Mm. It will be these generative AI tools. You're seeing Microsoft have one built in now. Uh, Google have Bard and after the initial mm. setbacks that cost them $100 billion mm. in, in their stock valuation because the market worked out that the algorithms weren't quite right. But now you're seeing Salesforce adding it in and it's become common for technology vendors to just build these tools in. So mm. it will become natural to use that as a tool to support our work. And I think over the next year, we're gonna see quite a big transformation in terms of how people do particularly routine tasks like writing letters, finding information, uh, compiling tables and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's just gonna penetrate very quickly. Yeah. Which parts, interestingly, which if you think, take a global view for a moment and you think industry just for a moment. Uh, and of course, the impact, the positive impact of GPT, we'll talk about the positive impact first of GPT on industries, on companies, on productivity can be immense. We, I think we've started to figure that out and it's only going to increase. But if you think about the the current landscape we have, and I want to take the direction, you know, the conversation in different directions. Let's talk about the whole industry of outsourcing and giving work to people in the gig economy, you know, be it Fiverr as an individual, an independent contractor, or actually at an industrial level or a B2B level, you know, giving a contract out to a, a technology company like a Wipro or Tata, you know, the, the sort of, in the old days, I'm a technologist as well. That's sort of common practice now, you know, you outsource parts of the organization. And an interesting thing I think about is how certain economies and industries in those economies are going to get a massive competitive advantage because of generative AI, like ChatGPT. So for example, and I, I would love your comment on this, you take a market like India that we're all familiar with, and India has, has uh, established itself as a technology uh, you know, technology center of excellence in, in, in every form of technology, all right? And uh, pretty all the innovation centers now are being built out of India as well. So it's moved away from just getting the menial repetitive work done to coding to now innovation, right? Which is phenomenal. And one of the things India always struggled with as a use case is language. So, you know, you had some brilliant people, but they weren't always on the forefront of communication or sales and, and so on. They didn't write script or they didn't write narrative of the website. That was sort of outsourced to the, the team in the West. And they, like, and they were like, no, don't worry, we'll do that. You just build me the wireframe. Chat GPT, I feel, has disrupted that. Absolutely, because now you can actually, with a little bit of guidance from the customer, build out the, the script and the text for the website, build out the storyboard and the narrative for a piece of marketing or a report. What's your view on the dynamics and the, the impact that ChatGPT will have on industries? And then where, where do you see this really making a, a massive difference on a positive end? So right now we're about three and a half months into the life of ChatGPT, and obviously yeah. The previous versions, GPT-1, GPT-2, GPT-3, yeah. have been around for a while. Yeah. So we could see the direction of travel. Yeah. I think we're still working it out, but you could see it being used more and more, not only to generate the, the text, if you like, but also to help generate the code. Mm. Uh, it's not always perfect, so you can't just be totally reliant on it. But the next version will be better and better. Uh, yeah. The way I describe it is that this technology right now if it was a car, we would be back at the kind of 1880s, 1890s version of an automobile with someone still walking in front of it with a flag. Mm. <laughs> We're really at the very earliest stages. And so I think we have to accept that. And we will see people using it in all sorts of applications, mm. generating productivity. That will also encourage organizations to say, well, do we need to outsource this? Yeah. Can we do it yeah. in-house now? Yeah. Because in the time it takes us to write the specification, we could actually build it 
and we can build it in a more iterative manner. Mm. We can start to use human centered design to work out what we really want, spend a bit more time on that and the, the different types of user journeys and then prototype the software a lot more than we can if we outsource, which mm. is one of the big challenges. Uh, but the outsourcers will also be thinking about this. I think what you'll start to see is them reduce their headcount maybe, but also branch out into training people into how the, to use these tools Correct. and creating educational software that allows people to do this. So I think we're going to see a spawning of IT creativity right? and many different scenarios of what it could look like in one, two, three years time. Mm. And there's a plausible case to argue that the outsourcing industry could get smaller, that it could look very different, or it could be massively bigger because it expands into all sorts of other activities that mm. weren't part of its domain before, before like doing the marketing, mm. like running HR for us, mm. uh, like writing our business processes and procedures, like providing the back office for startups. Mm. So they don't have to worry. They can just plug in to an entire suite of yeah. business support activity and focus on their core, yeah. uh, including things like validation with the authorities that everything you're doing is legal, decent and honest. Yeah, yeah. It reminds me of uh, one of my guests in the past, Tony Hughes, I think, um, wrote writes books about sales and sales and AI. And we were talking about the tech stack for sales. There is a tech stack for sales and the tech stack is different for different types of sales organizations, even based on culture, right? Whether it's a fast moving sale, a more software sale, a hardware sale, a complex sale and so on. And actually it works in different environments. And again, the, the, the conversation there, we're gonna to come to leadership was sales, smart salespeople who have diverse experience use the tech stack and they're very successful. They make loads of money, they hit their quotas, they love what they do. And actually many of them move jobs as well because they nail and crush their number. And they're like, two years, time to move to the next company, higher salary, hit my quota again. And you see these nomadic salespeople who are in a certain demographic, I would say sort of mid thirties to late thirties who get this um, technology piece really well uh, and are using it to their advantage. So they're massively empowered they end up in, in that space where technology is their friend. They don't fear it, they in fact embrace it. So we, we're seeing this in different functional uh, capacities and functional you know, roles in large organizations. But one of the things he did raise, which is a point I wanna go back to, which is to leadership, and then we'll go into some of the dark sides of, of potential uh, chat GPT in the future. But Lee, I think this is a problem, Rohit, because you and I can have this fantastic dialogue. I live and breathe this stuff. This is your gig. This is what you do when you go around educating leaders. And yet not a lot of leaders I don't know if you feel different now than you know 30 years ago. It's better, a little bit better. I think ChatGPT has really created a wow factor, a positive change towards AI. I definitely see this. I see this as a marketing campaign, free marketing for other enterprise AI companies, honestly, because everyone's waking up to it, you know. Um, but there is a concern back to the sales example where the sales leaders are still old school. Traditional sales leaders managing off spreadsheets, maybe Salesforce at best, they don't get this. And so how long is this going to carry on where the sales leader continues or the business leader continues to be somewhat ignorant uh, to the fact that this is the future? What are you seeing out there when you go and coach and you know, counsel some of these leaders in the enterprises? So the word ignorant is an interesting one, isn't it? Because what we're, what we're saying is they don't know what we know. Um, that doesn't make them ignorant. It, it just means that they haven't yet learned about the potential of what they can do with the next generation of tech and the way it can weave into what they have to do. Mm. Part of the problem is that we lead with the tech. Why should they even need to know about terms like the tech stack? Yeah, Instantly, yeah. we put a barrier up. What we need to do is to talk about what they're trying to do, which is get their heads around the client's needs, demonstrate that they have something that meets those needs or can enhance the way, enhance the way the client does what they do and then create the commercial deal around it. Uh, none of that sounds like a tech issue, but we've got tech to support it. So how do we weave it in and show them what they can do in natural language? And it, the, the skills I would say that we now need in tech 
are uh, upping our emotional quotient, mm -hmm. using nonviolent language, and writing and communicating in a way, going back to my oldest living revenue, a relative. Mm -hmm. If they can understand it, then there's no barrier. Most of the problems we have today with software adoption and the reason why so many digital projects fail to deliver the desired outcomes, because people don't understand, they're scared of the software, they're scared of using functionality that they don't understand and getting it wrong. So it's mm. better not to do it. They'd rather spend more time. There's also a fear that, well, if we start to do all this with software and it's being automated, does that take me out of the job? Mm. So we have to start really standing in the shoes of the end user mm. and the missing skill in a lot of tech organizations is human centered design to say who are the personas that we're trying to support here the different types of people mm. what is it they're trying to do what kind of journey do they want to go through how do we define the problem statement or the statement of requirements is it a problem we're trying to solve like there's a bottleneck in the way we process orders mm. is there a challenge we're trying to deal with which is our competitors are doing this 20% faster than us? Or is there an opportunity? For example, there's a whole new market opened up in, uh, in the, let's say, in the fintech space, but we need to operate very differently because they're working to very different business cycles to us. Hmm. And, and the clearer we can be in our statement of the requirement, the more chances we can deliver and then we can experiment with different solutions and then work out how to put the software in to support that. Mm. So often we're leading with the software and, and the yeah. project becomes getting the end user to use the software, not helping the end user see how this supports <clears throat> the way they want to work or the way they want to engage with their clients or mm. do what they have to do. And that's one of those big human challenges that isn't present enough. And that's why so many organizations are starting to embrace design thinking and human-centered design. And I'll come back on this again. It's also changing then what the core skills are for leaders. Uh, and, and what we're seeing is in a world where we're very uncertain about the future, you can't predict what the world will look like even in 2024. Right. So you can't be certain. So you have to have the skills to enable you to respond very flexibly. And that means you have to be good at learning at speed, both picking up new material and recognizing you need to keep learning, but also learning how to learn faster as you, as your project teams, as your functional teams, and as an organization. The second is you need to get really good at innovation, whether it's the core skills like facilitation, problem solving, creative thinking, but also at using these processes like human-centered design we also need to build in foresight so we're understanding the different scenarios you might have to solve for. And then the final bit is transformational thinking, which is this idea of letting go of our cherished assumptions and beliefs and thinking about, well, what might we need for the world we're moving into and constantly going back and saying, what if we were starting again? How mm. would we do this? Yeah, yeah. And that's very uncomfortable. But those four things are now becoming core skills if we want leaders who can navigate us through an uncertain world where we don't know the answers today but we have to respond flexibly so yeah. we, we're having to change at speed we're having to learn new ways of working <clears throat> we have to recognize that despite our reliance on it it's not the driver here the driver is about people and how they adapt and how we support them with tech Mm. Or how, if we're automating roles, then what do we do about those people who are freed up? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, 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 um, it seems like a, a problem that's been, you know, it's systemic. It's been going on for a while back in the 80s, 90s, uh, 2000s. And even now, this con you know, the conversation around IT and business has been going on for ages. I think it's got better because you've, you know, over generations, you've seen people move from certain roles, non-IT roles into IT roles and vice versa. So there's been cross-pollination. It has got better. Uh, but what tends to happen though, I see anyway, and, you know, appreciate your commentary around this is 
something that's hot and sexy and snazzy and fun for one person. I mean, technology generally is, you know, chat GPT, why it's popular for non-technologists because it's like cool and it's new. Oh my God. Wow. It's got a, it's got an incredible sizzle and actually it's, the steak's pretty tasty too. And so it's a great product. You know, when Zoom came out, even if you weren't interested in technology, it's just a fantastic product. I mean, the, the video quality was great. You had all these widgets and yes, it got people talking technology a little bit. And then, you know, it got them more comfortable with technology in their business roles. So that, that has been a positive change. Yet you see um, in large organizations, you still see that Kodak moment happening. You know, we, we I mean, I, I remember I, I talk a lot about these four archetypes, you know, dwindlers, Darwin's, disruptors and dominators. And these dwindlers are the ones who are like, you know, haven't woken up and ever smelt the coffee. They're like the rigidites. There's, there's still those organizations out there. There's still those clusters. Do you see in your experience that, that if you think of it as a pyramid almost, but like those being the largest in the old school days, like the ones not willing to change, are you seeing some changes now in terms of the responses that you're getting and reactions you're getting from leaders in positions of power? And to what extent, um, you know, do you believe that change is coming? It's not a universal thing. You're seeing very different perspectives. Uh, I did a session last week. This is a really good example for mm. me. I did a session in Malaysia last week with the chairs of some of the biggest banks and financial institutions. And around the room, it's a round table. You had very different perspectives. You had the people who really wanted to make sure that they were future-proofing their organization against a whole range of things. You had people who couldn't get past. Uh, one of the people in the room went onto their tablet and asked, what do you think of Rohit Talwa? And they couldn't get past the fact that ChatGPT said, well, I'm a piece of AI, I don't have opinions. They couldn't get it. They couldn't get that this was software rather than another human. And therefore there was no room for any other possibility to come mm. in until this thing was perfect. Mm. even though none of us have ever connected with perfect in any aspect of our lives, if we're being honest. And then there was someone else who went, well, what if Joe Biden wanted to know what the world thought about the war in Ukraine right now? Uh, uh, when ChatGPT was upgraded mm. to have current information. And I was like, wow, what a question. There's Joe Biden armed with 21 different intelligence agencies, embassies in most parts of the world or consulates. And the idea that Biden would go to chat GPT for that answer was insane. And that they wouldn't, if they did, that they wouldn't break it up and say, tell us the views or the range of views in different demographies. But again, this person couldn't get past that. And so we have to recognize that people are starting from very different places mm. And sometimes we have to accept that you can't take on the, the responsibility for changing the mindsets of all these people who have 20, 30, 40, 50 years of experience and ways right. of thinking. Right. And you just have to accept that a bit like certain species, they have to die out. Mm. So few organizations live on past 20, 30, 40 years. Quite often it's because the leaders don't evolve and the question is, what did you do? Do you spend a lot of time and money and waste a lot of shareholder money by letting them live on? Or do you kind of just support the new and, and the people mm. who get it and the world we're moving into? And it's, it's a very sad thing that those organizations might decline. But sometimes we have to. Civil, we don't have the Roman Empire, the Egyptian uh, you know, Empire, the British Empire they're not all still here. Things decline. And we just have to accept that there are these cycles and it becomes these people's responsibility yeah. to educate themselves and adapt if they want to play in the new world. But they can't try keep trying to make the world configure to their view of it. Mm. And I, I worry about the amount of effort we put in in trying to convince them and then getting very minor improvements. Yeah, yeah. I have this all the time. I'll give you a simple example. Mm. The most common request right now is talk about the world in 2030. And, and so they say, what do you think are going to be the biggest influences? And I always come up with the same five things. Mm. Right now, it's how AI and exponential technologies evolve. 
it's how we respond to climate change and, uh, and the various environmental boundaries that we're transgressing. It's what happens around people enhancing their brains and bodies. It's about the new economic models and groupings that might emerge. Mm. And it's about how we as individuals evolve our mindset from, is it all about me? Is it about me and my community? Mm. Is it about me and my country? Or is it about me and this planet? Uh, and when you talk about that, they go, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's all bigger than a brain fall. So talk about stuff I understand and let's pretend that's 2030. So they end up wanting you to talk about either the last two or three years correct? Yeah. or at best what they see going on now and somehow trying to project it. And so genetically, most people are incapable of thinking out five or seven years and taking on board the kind of things that might shape that. Mm. So the best they'll do in most cases is go to forecasts where they mm. pay forecasters to take what's going on now and project it out without any kind of sense of how these other things might impact us. Correct, yeah. Uh, and so embracing the future, thinking about how things might be different and then how that might impact me and my world uh, is very hard for most people and that's why you don't see much of it. Plus the context we're in mm. means that most of us are focused on relatively near-term targets. If we're in a public company, quite often it's quarterly targets. We're surrounded by what's going on now. There's the urgent, there's the important, quite narrow things that we have to deal with, the crisis or the projects we're kind of trying to get delivered all the time. We're trying to do too much. Mm. So there's very little headspace. There's very little energetic space, emotional space in, in us to deal with these quite mm. challenging concepts. And even if we accept that, yeah, this might be important, we want to turn it into, well, what do we do right now about it mm. rather than what do we need to learn more about? Yeah. Yeah. You make a brilliant point. Uh, let's move towards, therefore, as you talk about people's abilities or inabilities to, to think ahead and that foresight. Uh, let's talk about the dark side of this scenario. You know, it sounds fantastic right now. And yes, we know it's baby steps three and a half months old, a little baby really. And, you know, gosh, when it grows up very quickly and it'll grow up very quickly, the implications are going to be huge. Tell us a little bit about some of the stuff that worries you. Uh, I may not worry, but you think we should worry about where if it's not controlled, it could uh, cause us some serious problems in society and in business. So the obvious challenges right now is uh, about 170 billion <laughs> if you like, data points in there or parameters mm. in chat GPT, more in some of the others, it's moving to about a trillion, but it's still not complete. Mm. And so there's always the risk that the training is biased, mm. that it's an incomplete data set. It doesn't cover every language in the world. It sometimes doesn't get it right because of the way the algorithm's constructed. Yeah. And it might be just if it's based on the amount of content there is on something, it might be weighted towards views from certain parts of the world. So there's always that issue. Yeah. Um, it may not give complete answers yeah. and, and people may over rely on it and you don't necessarily have <clears throat> sources, although hopefully that will be fixed in future editions. Um, so there's all those things. There's obviously the risk that um, people will use it for nefarious purposes in the same way as we do with Google and the dark web. Mm. If I want to, I can find out how to make a dirty bomb. Mm. If I want to, I can find out how to do a mass poisoning of the water systems. There's a risk, that, and right now, it, uh, there's a kind of level of blocking of that stuff, but then the question is, who's determining what you block and what's acceptable or not? Mm. So there's all those risks. There's a risk that certain groups who in society believe they have a view might be deemed to be unacceptable by whoever's governing this but also it could we're, we're, right now it's called generalized ai the goal is to move to what's called artificial general intelligence that's as smart as us and largely self-governing and then maybe towards artificial super intelligence that's smarter than us 
There won't just be one, there'll be several, and they'll be potentially competing with each other. And they'll be evolving so fast that we won't possibly be able to keep up. And so the question is who monitors them? Who monitors what they're doing with our data? How do we ensure they're taking uh, into account ethical standards? Right. Because a competitive opportunity. And people talk about creating AI to monitor the AI, which might cover some of it. But there's almost no way we can monitor all the AI being developed uh, in someone's bedroom or all over the place. Mm. So that's going to be one of our biggest challenges. Right now, there are mainly voluntary codes. Uh, and the common feature is they're largely being ignored mm. um, because of the, com the commercial opportunity. Uh, and so there are all those kinds of things. I'm less worried about people being excluded from access because they don't know how to use the technology because the interfaces are conversational. Mm -hmm. So that's my least worry because I can talk, I can gesture, I can, I can type whatever my physical uh, challenges might be or my abilities uh, that will support me. Um, I don't know how they'll deal with people with neurodiverse perspectives who yeah. who just look at things differently. So there's a whole range of things. And really, we're just beginning to work out what the domains of challenge are. Mm. And we're nowhere near solutions. And I think we'll keep evolving in all of these. Mm. And uh, there's always the potential for, if you like, so-called bad actors to use these techs in ways that we couldn't even imagine, mm. but also for people to use the tech to gain undue political or economic advantage. Uh, and for a lot of people to be left behind, I think the stratification mm. of society could increase and we could end up seeing a much <laughs> bigger group of people who are left out. I don't want to use the term underclass, but people who just don't have access yeah. to all of this. Yeah. And then the question is what happens to them and who cares about them? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we talk a lot about the the divide between the rich and the poor globally now with everything that's going on geopolitically and economically and so on. And technology was always supposed to be an equalizer. That's, you know, when when I was taught technology, technology was the equalizer. Everything else was a little bit un unequal, but technology in the hands of everyone allowed you to be incredible, invincible, great, fantastic, live, live out your dreams manifest or whatever it may be. And of course, you know, this device is a supercomputer. And when this becomes a hologram or, you know, a hologram pops out of it at some point that you can interact with, like in the movies, we will have a different age that we all live in. Um, what worries me, though, is the average age of you know, people in certain countries. You look at a country like India or, um, you know, where 28, you know, 60% of the population is under the age of 28. So they're all young. Many of them are younger. So about this, I'm 44 by the time, 20 years down the line, I'll be 64. I'll be a geriatric, I don't know. Um, but they'll still be sort of gunning away and building their next startup because the age of the average startup founder is increasing. Interestingly, I read a report the other day because I built my company when I was 30, 35, I don't know, 36. It was old actually in those days. And now there was a report that says, in fact, 45 plus is a sweet spot because you've got life experience, you've made the mistakes and, and so on and so forth. Um, what's going to happen with adoption again? Because certain countries like the UK, you know, I don't know what our average age is these days, but it's certainly about 40. And because um, we're older and we're having less kids, so there's a low fertility rate and so on and so forth. Um, where do you see this playing out in terms of equality and the balance of power geopolitically because that this is a huge element it's not just about companies i mean that's one element but it's about society and it's also about countries and their competitive stance given that we've uh, our prime minister in the uk has just done some negotiation with northern ireland and, and with the eu what's your view it could be uk it could be global what's your view on uh, the balance of power when it comes to technology who's gonna who's gonna dominate well it's interesting isn't it that that story that we had about technology being the great leveler yeah that was a very western centric perspective yeah because yeah. built into it were the assumptions that everyone using it had been educated through a western style system and had that logic model mm. uh, that everyone had continuous electricity to be able to power these things mm. that everyone had or would have wireless connectivity those are not givens 
Mm. We've got 2 billion people who are unserved or underserved right, with broadband yeah. connectivity. So we need a different model. We need some different ways of developing this stuff in languages, in ways of accessing this technology, maybe uh, using much more of a, uh, an iconography that people can understand rather than language to get that kind of access. And also this has become a key source of competitive advantage in terms of the digital literacy of society and the level of digital adoption. Mm. So it's about the rate then at which countries can get their people up to speed in these technologies and how we make sure these technologies are supportive of the, the cultural norms and behavioral uh, aspects of any society rather than having them learn those aspects as well. So yeah. having to learn how a Westerner thinks and how Western communities work in order to use some of these tools. Mm. And we don't understand that enough. And we assume we've got to do it to them or give it to them or manage it for them with whoever the them are. But them are the majority. Mm. And so these things are going to evolve. We're going to see a lot more domestically grown technology, if you like, and domestically developed solutions that are targeted at the world, if you like, in its broader sense. And the good thing is that the cost of developing the tech is falling. People are creating their own tech. I've just come back from Malaysia, as I said. Mm. And one of the things I saw that blew my mind was Asia Pacific University, big institute for science and technology. They are cutting edge in drones, but they're making most of their own components because they can't afford to buy them. Correct. And, and it's that kind of creativity that we're going to see and we want to encourage. So you've got local development, local ownership, yeah. and a local drive to raise people's capability in these technologies that will largely run our planet. Um, at, but again, we don't know all the answers and nor should we because we're sat in the West. Mm. We should be doing a lot more listening to people in those markets to say, well, what do you think? How does this work for you? What can we what can be done to help people in your markets accelerate their adoption and make these technologies work for them? Mm. Mm. How are you using? We're coming to the end of the hour. Time flies by really quickly. In fact, we have. But before I go, uh, for, last couple of questions. The first one is, are you using these technologies in your industry, in the industry of publishing and research, and to what extent? Yeah, absolutely. So there's nothing that I do now where I don't either take what I'm writing or doing and check it against these tools. Mm. Uh, if I'm planning an event, yeah, Session mm. Labs become the go-to. If I'm designing a presentation, uh, I use a variety of image generation tools. Mm. If I'm planning a course, I will take what I think I want to do and then search mainly with ChatGPT to say, what do you think should be in a course? Give me your sense of how a course should be structured. Yeah. So I can cross check. And, and uh, I don't feel like that's cheating. I feel like that's a power tool. Mm. And more and more, I'm starting to sort of learn about other tools that I can use in the way I plan my life. Mm. And I, I also ask questions. So do I need uh, a new scheduling tool that allows me to combine my personal with my business well no actually I'm quite happy with the diary I have and I don't think there's anything that would go on there mm. I love now using some of the editing tools mm. that allow me to do things faster so I, I'm bringing in tools that fit with what I need to do in my job mm. uh, and there's a few things that I really want to use more so in meetings I'm using a variety of AI transcription tools to capture the meeting in audio to capture the transcript to capture a summary mm. and to throw out a summary of the actions that we agreed yeah that's all becoming part of my ecosystem of tools mm. uh, i could probably use more but it's also about my ability to absorb them and my a lot of my work is in front of people mm. in a room training speaking engaging so it's about the amount of time I have mm. and how much I want to learn, allocate to 
learning the tools versus learning the content. Mm, yeah, brilliant. I uh, love it because using this stuff in what you do is evidence that uh, it works and it's, 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 you know, materially making a difference to your life, which I'm sure it is. What would you say to um, folks in the next generation? You, you gave an example of the 20 year old and you said this is their life looks like. Um, what is what is it that you leave them with now in terms of positivity and hope? Uh, because it, it is a little bit doom and gloom for some of the younger generations um, in different parts of the world. I mean, if I travel to the east, it's not as um, it's actually quite positive. You know, the young people going out to India or um, other parts of Asia are quite gung ho. You know, they're all motivated. Their startup economies are growing. The role models are uh, at, at the you know at, at peak. The, the money that's available to build businesses and entrepreneurs um, getting mentoring and training, all of that stuff is, you know, rising and climbing because they, they've had, they've pole vaulted a lot of the things that the West has had to deal with. We've had, we have lev- legacy, we have legacy infrastructure, although we're, we were the first in many things. Now we're dealing with unpacking the legacy. What would you say to the UK and Europe and maybe, you know, the US, some of the young people who are now getting their first jobs, uh, trying to figure out what job to do, um, how do we give them that optimism and that drive to say oh, that there could be a better world for me and it's possible and it may not be the, 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 the normal distribution, you know, go get a job, hang out in a consultancy for five years, learn the ropes, and then you can build your own company. Maybe there's a new rule book. What would you say to them, given that you're at the epicenter of this? The first has to be keep learning, keep exploring, keep experimenting, give yourself permission to fail, uh, keep thinking about who do I need to communicate to yeah. and how do I adapt the way I'm communicating to get across to those people rather than talking in the language I get and my colleagues get how do I talk in the language of the generations around me and the people who might be three times my age mm. and accept that that's an interesting learning challenge that's something you you're acquiring uh, don't keep trying to force your idea to into people show the outcomes, show the benefits, mm. show what we're trying to do here and why it could work. Mm. Think, stand in their shoes, treat them as personas in a design exercise. Mm. Mm. Where are they coming from? What are the issues they're most likely to raise? So start from there. And mm. I always say, whatever age you are, whoever you are, the people with the most power in any situation are the most flexible, the most adaptable. They're our go-to people. They're the people we tend to go to to do new stuff, to try new stuff, because they're willing to learn and experiment and fail. So be those people and keep adding new skills, not just tech skills, but the core skills that you can take to any job. Creativity, problem solving, collaboration. Invest some time in learning nonviolent communication. Mm. Just so you can use language that never hurts anyone or never makes anyone feel like they've just been slapped in the way you've used it. Like terms like with all due respect, hmm. Hmm. we know there's no respect in that. Term, <laughs> right? And, and uh, to get away from using the but and to use the act and all yeah. those kinds of things yeah. that sometimes we forget. And it's those kind of skills that accelerate us with the opportunities we get that have people like us and want to work with us. And it's always going to be the same that if people like you, Mm. opportunities open up if if you're difficult you can be brilliant but it's much harder to navigate the world mm. if, if you only view it from your perspective and to gain experience learn languages get out work in different parts of the mm. world accumulate new ideas go work with people with nothing in the charity sector in the voluntary sector mm. expose yourself to the world in all sorts of ways because with things like human enhancement and life extension yeah it could be very common for that generation to live well beyond 100 and to be able to work into their 90s and beyond so if you see that as a vista then what do you want to do uh and how and also think about your hobbies think about your interests Mm. and how might you take those into becoming your business at some point Mm. that you earn money out of doing the things you love not just working for someone else doing what you feel you have to until you've earned enough and learned enough to go and do what you really want to do 
Beautiful. That's a that's very powerful and compelling. And we will script that, of course, when we get this out uh, in in our signature message out to the young people, because I think they need all the support they can get. And, you know, you you say it so brilliantly. Oscar Wilde says, you know, be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. You're one of those individuals who's decided that you know who you are and you're unique in your own right. And you continue to fight this cause. And I respect you for that because it's uh, it's exciting, but it's also very difficult to change people's minds. And it's lovely to see uh, when you your work and your message starts to take effect. It, it must be so lovely to see people changing their minds and becoming more flexible and doing some of the things that you've wanted them to do for a long time. And uh, for that, I respect you immensely, Rohit. Thank you for coming on the show. Uh, you must come back again when you have your next book because we'd like to unpack it and talk about it. Before you go, last 10 seconds, how has the experience been for you on Straight Talk today? I'm sure you speak a lot and you're on many podcasts. A few words around how we've done today and a bit of feedback. So. We'll, we'll hold on to that and do better the next time. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun and it's been great to have a sort of longer conversation so we can unpack things more deeply mm. and dive deeper into the ideas. And I'm a very wordy git, so <laughs> it's helped <laughs> me to ramble on. You and me uh, both. It's fine. You, you've indulged me, so thank you so much. Yeah, real pleasure. I've really enjoyed it and I'm, I'm glad we met. And we'll con continue to keep meeting and collaborating. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rohit Dalvar, on our show. Where can people find you so they can buy your books and engage with you? Yeah, you can search me and find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, all the social mm -hmm. media platforms, and on our website, uh, fastfuture.com. And my personal email is rohit at fastfuture.com. So you can Perfect. reach me in all those channels, and I'm not a prima donna. I will pretty much <laughs> reply to everyone who contacts me or yeah. messages me on one of those platforms. Superb. That's very, very um, kind of you and a lot of humility. So with that in mind, thank you very much uh, for listening. Please click on that subscribe button on the bottom right and the, the bell so you get notified. We will have many, many amazing authors and guests on our show over the coming weeks. Uh, Rohit, thank you again. Be well. Keep smiling. Keep doing this incredible work that you're doing. Um, Godspeed. Thank you.